Join me for a conversation with New York Times bestselling author, Philip Athens. Welcome to DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Level up your RPG campaigns by filling yourself with stories and knowledge. Explore topics from archaeology to film history to writing to literature and much, much more. This is DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Welcome to the show. My name is Matt and I am your host. This is the DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG RPG show. This is the podcast where we learn how to become better game masters and better role players by filling ourselves with stories and knowledge. Now, I have an amazing interview today with a New York Times bestselling author. But before we jump into that, if you don't know who I am, my name is Matt Davids. I am the creator of the Books of Random Tables book series, as well as the author of the No Prep Game Master, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Random Tables. If you want to cut down your Game Master or your Dungeon Master prep time, check out some of my books because my mission is to help Game Masters cut down their prep time so they don't get burned out and they can run fun sessions at the table each and every week and still manage to have a life with spouses, jobs, school, work, kids, whatever it is. You can find my books at Amazon.com, DriveThroughRPG.com, or DiceGeeks.com. Or you could just hop over to Google, type in DiceGeeks, all one word, and all your dreams will come true. Or you'll just see some of my books and my website. But enough of all that. Let's just get right into the interview. My guest today is New York Times bestselling author with many Dungeons & Dragons novels to his credit, Philip Athens. Philip, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Just before we get into some of your books, I really want to ask you about writing monsters. But before we do that, how were you first introduced to tabletop role-playing games? Oh, man, it was um, a really long time ago. You know, sort of in the, it was really in the late 70s. I've always been a science fiction and fantasy fan for as long as I can remember. And it was really, there were, there was an ad always on the sort of back cover or somewhere in analog magazine that I subscribed to back in the day for what turned into Steve Jackson games. I think the company was called meta gaming and they had, were selling micro games then these little just folio kind of board games. And I ordered some of those from that ad and I had another, you know, friend of mine who was a bit also a big, science fiction fan we started playing those really like obsessively it was, those were games like ogre and warp war and stuff like that from way back in the day and they had a game called oh I, now i can't remember what it was called but it ended up turning into what they called the fantasy trip which was sort of a you know board game that was really a combat like a gladiator combat um game that that they sort of turned into a role-playing game and that friend had heard of Dungeons and Dragons and said, I should get that. This is cool. Cause we started kind of expanding on that, mm. um, you know, fantasy trip and, you know, he bought it and it was like, great, excited to play this. This is, that sounds really cool. You know? So <laughs> we went over to his house. He had read the rules and we just started rolling up characters exactly as they said in the book, you know, just like we were playing board games cause we were playing a lot of board games, you just kind of do what the rule book tells you to do. And, you know, I rolled up this character, just sort of straight up three dice on everything. My highest score was intelligence. So he's like, you know, you're going to be a magic user. I thought that sounded cool. You know, that, right? I'm a magic user. Cool. So, you know, he's like, it says you use this four-sided die. It's one to four hit points. <laughs> so it took us a while to figure out how to work that, like how to read it. <laughs> From, yeah. These were the dice in the old basic set. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, so I rolled it and I got a one and yeah. I thought for hit points, I thought, is that one sounds bad? Like, <laughs> sounds like if anything hits me, no matter what, it's going to at least get one, right? Aren't I just going to die immediately? And he's like, no, that can't be right. Let's just play it and we'll see what happens. And so what happened was that I went down the stairs into that first dungeon and there was a skeleton there. I was like, that sounds cool. We're going to fight the skeleton. We roll for initiative, the skeleton wins, it hits me and I die. 
And we're like <laughs> pouring through the little blue book going, that can't be right. We got to be playing this wrong. That's just, this game is terrible. And <laughs> I don't know, this game sucks. And so I spent like the rest of the summer just thinking D&D &D was the dumbest game of all time. It's just roll up a character and then immediately die. That somehow the game balance was completely way off. And then we started high school, right? So this would have been um, the summer of 1978 and the beginning of that school year and met a bunch of new people and met a couple of guys who were actually playing D&D like for real, <laughs> like, knew not to just go with one person, one first level magic user into a dungeon with one hit point. <laughs> and, you know, the sort of the rest was history. That was like all I did through high school in particular was just D and D D and D D and D like four or five times a week, four or five times a week. Yeah. Like multiple games. Wow. We started a games club in our high school that hadn't existed before. Um, and, you know, started playing a D and D or first edition D and D when the, uh, dungeon master's guide wasn't even out yet. They were sort of excerpts that they were publishing in dragon. So I'm kind of going way back there. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And actually I had an experience with a uh, magic user with one hit point as well, because, um, mm -hmm. when I was playing and like my, with my older brother and his, his friend who was the, uh, dungeon master uh none of the other players or my brother would protect my character <laughs> they they just didn't they just that doesn't just didn't cross their mind to to, to right. try to protect me so i i died quite a bit and so it was just like all right well i'm not gonna i'm not gonna make a magic user like that i'm gonna make something with a ton right. of hit points because nobody will protect me <laughs> <laughs> is fighter from for me from now on <laughs> yeah exactly exactly yeah. now uh when you're you were playing so much did you start uh running games really quickly oh, yeah yeah so i started running i mean once we really got like i got the the three core ad and d books for christmas that year so that would have been 78 um and you know almost immediately after that started running this uh ongoing game on saturdays it was pretty much every saturday almost every saturday all day saturday um with my younger brother and a bunch of our friends um that went on for at least another year after high school so four years five years um and then the games club met twice a week and then another friend sort of had his ongoing campaign where we would go on usually Friday nights and sometimes just be up all night, like break up and go home at like four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And then I would get a little bit of sleep and by 11 or 1130 on Saturday morning, we were playing mine. So it was just really D and D, D and D, D and D. And then we started to discover other stuff, right? We, he started running Gamma World. We were kind of big on Gamma World for a while. I discovered Traveler. That was my thing. I was trying to get everybody to play Traveler. Mostly they didn't want to, but I kept trying. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, you know, we kind of always, we, you know, as new games came out, somebody would adopt it and say, like, this is it. I'm running Champions. Um, but we, everybody eventually, you know, we would always end up just going back to D&D. &D. Uh -huh. what, what caught your interest about Traveler so much? I just well, I was a science fiction fan, I think, before I really discovered fantasy. Like, I was a science fiction fan just as a little kid. Like, I lived on Star Trek and Lost in Space and stuff like that. Um, that's what I started reading when I really started reading Isaac Asimov and whoever else I could get my hands on. And it wasn't until I started really reading, I got into comic books, Marvel comics in particular, in probably like fourth or fifth grade. And, you know, they were doing the Conan books then and, and, you know, they have little ads in the fantastic. I was a big fantastic four fanatic. And they'd be like, who's this Conan? It's like weird. Cause he's not part of the whole Marvel universe or anything like that. Um, and started reading those and, and they were really good about crediting Robert E. Howard. And so that's how, and I was like, I should just read the original stories. This guy is awesome. And, you know, <laughs> that was that was my entree into fantasy. So a little bit later. But what I liked about Traveler was that it was just 
it was everything I liked about D and D, but with that kind of, um, you know, hard sci-fi setting that, I, that, you know, I was always into. You know, a lot of people who listen to the show are game masters or dungeon masters. Uh, do you have maybe one key piece of advice for a dungeon master? Um, yeah, first of all, run first edition because it's the best. It's never, <laughs> no, no. The, you know, the best edition of D&D is the one you first played. So, yeah. I mean, that's always, that's always going to be true, I think. But, um, you know, don't be, af- I, I would say don't be afraid to cheat in favor of your characters. It, you know, don't let it become competitive. Um, it, it should be about fun, right? Yeah. Have fun all the time. First, have fun. You know, then do, you know, then worry about world building and, you know, being really serious about it. I think a lot of uh, D&D groups have gotten too serious about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is, I guess there's always kind of a tension between that. Uh, I know back in the day, yeah. right, the, the dungeon master was supposed to crush the, the, the player right. characters, <laughs> right. you know. Um, and, and I think those were the people that, that, the rest of the, you know, sort of D and D players and the whatever at the school or in the neighborhood or wherever, um, ended up really not wanting to, um, play with anymore, yeah. you know, like I don't really want to, and that was, a, to me, that was the thing that I loved about D and D because I never really was a competitive person by nature. So, and I was never, um, I mean, you're talking to like one of the original nerds. So I was never like an athletic kid. I was never the kid, you know, on the baseball team or on the football team. And this idea of a, com- of a cooperative game where we're just all in this together and we're on an adventure and not somebody is the winner and then somebody's the loser. And, you know, yeah. really, really was what captured me completely. I mean, that was the thing that made it from, hey, this is pretty cool and I like the genres and stuff like that to, like this is a lifestyle for me. Like it was my lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when I, you know, when I see people who are like, I'm going to try to game the system and min max it and you know, that kind of thing that, that bothers me a lot. Cause it, it just takes away from the, what I think is ultimately the, the genius of it. I, I think your advice there is really good. Cause I, I know, I think I can remember back to, <laughs> Uh, when I really started having a lot of fun running games was when I kind of realized that uh, my players needed to have fun too. <laughs> right. right. And so, you know, and I had done that once before I was like, there was one player who was kind of the shy, there's always the shy guy, you know, who doesn't really um, tend to speak up. He doesn't really t- kind of take any kind of leadership role or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And I thought I'm going to, so sort of force him to be in charge of stuff <laughs> man and, and sort of engineered it to kill everyone else. Um, and then gave him some, he had had some kind of magic item that made him immune to this particular thing and just sort of forced him to basically play by himself while everybody else sat there staring at him, like don't die. You know, <laughs> Someone <laughs> has to get our bodies back to town or whatever back and, and bring us back to life. Um, so that was the, that was the closest thing I ever came to that sort of total party kill thing, which to me was just total campaign kills. Like now, what do we do on Saturday? Yeah, um, yeah. you know, I'm, I don't want to just end this. This is terrible. Well, um, you know, since you were playing so much, and then now kind of looking back, you know, just from me, like reading about your career, uh, what was it like for you then? Because you went to work for TSR, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, much, much later, though. And yeah. so I kept playing and, you know, went to college and kind of got into the punk rock thing. And it was kind of, you know, had this very brief spell of I was too cool for that and too cool for the other thing. And um, <laughs> happily got over that. You know, that was that that it, it was a, an acute rather than chronic condition. <laughs> and then, so, you know, after college, I sort of reconnected with those same friends or, you know, some kind of a core group of those same guys from high school. Um, and we just picked up more or less where we left off. My long running campaign was, was ancient history by that time. But, um, and just, you know, we just kept playing and, you know, also playing other different games, but mostly 
um, D and D. We sort of started to get into magic a little bit, and at that point, I was I was start had started writing. I was writing a lot of short stories. I was writing poetry and um, publishing a little literary magazine, doing stuff like that. And thought, meanwhile, working in some you know retail jobs and stuff like that to just kind of make ends meet. And I thought, boy, I you know if I want to do this for real, I better start trying to you know, write something that is going to, you know, might make me a couple dollars. And, you know, I thought I love D and D. I love traveler. I love role playing games in general. Could I be work, you know, could I be writing for some of these guys? And I did, I started to, you know, pick up some freelance projects and, um, did some writing for traveler, you know, you know, to sort of put myself out there as much as I could. Um, started a bunch of projects for companies that then went um, either just disappeared completely. One of them literally disappeared and ghosted me. Like, you know, I was halfway through this thing and they just stopped answering the phones and stopped answering, you know, mailing letters. This is how long ago that was. Um, But a few of them were published. And then eventually I sent a, a proposal to TSR. This would have been in 95, right? Summer of 95. And I got a call back saying, can you come in for an interview? And I thought, oh, uh, sure. You know, because <laughs> I just thought I was going to do this sort of freelance thing. And maybe they thought this would was a good idea. Or maybe they'd throw me some other, you know, just, you know, um, you know, writing freelance work. Mm-hmm. And I went in and it was an interview with the book publishing team, which was really awesome, right? Because I had been writing fiction and publishing fiction and, and, you know, that was definitely where I saw myself going and, um, lo and behold, I got the job. I thought I blew the interview <laughs> horrible. I blew the interview and was so surprised a couple of days later when they called me back, but you know, you never know. Yeah. And so, then so that was did... like September of 95. I started there. Oh, okay. The so TSR was... in Lake Geneva. Yeah. So then what were you, were you doing for uh, TSR then? I was an editor for the book publishing team. So they just, and you know, just thrown right in, you know, like, <laughs> okay, you're working on this. Here's the, you know, five books that you're, you know, that you're assigned to. Um, <laughs> they don't tell you what to do. It, yeah. It was just like, okay, go. <laughs> you know? I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, like I've heard of Troy Denning. I wrote, I read his dark sun books. Like really, I'm going to be his editor now for this. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, he's a nice guy. Go ahead. And he really was. Troy was really, kind of took me under his wing, you know? Uh-huh. Um, and, you know, there was a, 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 you know, other editors there who I sort of attached myself to. And um, I was smart enough to know not to pretend I was smarter than I was, I guess that, if that makes a little bit of sense. And I just kept my ears open and learned as much as I could just soaked up as much as I could. Cause you know, as you can imagine like kid who played D and D in 1978, and now I'm like working there. It was the it was as much the dream job as as you could possibly imagine. I mean, I was just like, this is the greatest thing in the world. Yeah, yeah, I can only imagine. Yeah. Um, it does seem though that uh, a lot of people who play Dungeons and Dragons either want to write or become writers. Do you mm-hmm. find that that's true? Yeah, and actually, if you look through. You know, I, I think there are some authors out there who really embrace it and will tell you, like I'm mm-hmm. um, a D and D Patrick Rothfuss and um, yeah. George R. R. Martin. I'll talk about you know playing D and D and having played D and D. And then there are some that try to hide it, and you can tell, <laughs> like from paragraph one, you're like, oh yeah, this guy's totally a D and D. This guy's a total D and D player. Um, so you know, and and it's. You know, there are actors who have talked about it publicly, mm-hmm. Mike Myers and um, Stephen Colbert and Vin Diesel. And, you know, I think it's a game that kind of appeals to, definitely appeals to the writer and people. It did for me mm-hmm. and it did for an awful lot of other people mm-hmm. who, you know, were like Ed Greenwood created the Forgotten Realms as a setting for his short stories mm-hmm. and, you know, some novel that he was going to write someday. And then when he discovered D and D, it became the setting for his his own D and D game. Um, 
and then right it started to become articles and dragon and then um tsr bought the forgotten realm slock sock and barrel so and that you know it, it i think it really covers this real range of people like me who tend to be very um you know kind of private and and you know kind of a loner where i i love writing because it's something i can literally do by myself and then involve like one or two people in that you know yeah. it's a very very small kind of intimate hidden process um and then there's the people you know like these uh actors who it, it it's such an improv environment right yeah. that it, you can see how it, it that kind of mindset would really gravitate toward it yeah Absolutely. Um, I, you mentioned something there. Why, why do you think some writers would try to hide it just because it's like not cool or something? I, I, you know, I think it, I don't know. And this is, I think a great thing, right? Is that this whole concept of, you know, geek chic or nerd <laughs> culture or whatever you yeah. want to call it yeah. that has happened over the last, it seems like only a minute, but it's been like 20, 25 years already. That yeah. Yeah. Is just, I, you know, I think, for people who are, you know, if you're listening to this and you're like in your teens or early 20s, it's like you have no idea what it was like to be the 10 kids in the high school who played D&D or the five kids in the high school oh, yeah. who played D&D. Oh. And it was just like, what is this crazy, psycho, idiot stuff that you guys are doing? Um, and it was just another way to carve you out of the society and you know, yeah. may, oh, yeah. make you a third class citizen and then of course there was all that nonsense about um oh it's it's devil worship and it's it will drive you crazy and you actually and if you're playing it you actually believe in the occult and you believe that the spells are actually going to work yeah. um and then we're all just sort of sitting there saying I, that's your trip, you know. <laughs> we we we're holding the rule book in our hands. We know that this is pretend. That's the that's the joy of it, you know. Yeah. Stop trying to make this evil. Yeah. Um, but it really wasn't something that you were, you know, out uh, necessarily in the late seventies and really through most of the eighties. Yeah. Um, at least I, I'm, I, maybe it was just me. I didn't feel that way. <laughs> you know, it was something that it wasn't like we all were like this hidden little secret group or anything, but it kind of did. It felt that way a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. it felt like a fringe culture that you were in. The conventions were way smaller than they are now. <laughs> um, I mean, the last Gen Con I went to, which is ages ago now, right? I think it was 2007 was so mammoth i just thought how did this happen you know like, the, how did the secret get out in some ways you know when i went to the first gen con i went to was in a college in um wisconsin and you know it was a i thought it was a pretty good crowd we're like this is this is amazing you know look at all these people and it was i probably a hundredth of the number of people that go to Gen Con now or less, a thousand. I don't know, you know, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Really, 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 really much smaller. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't know if maybe that's, you know, a feeling that I don't want to admit that I'm a nerd. I don't know why a, a fantasy author would ever have that. Yeah, <laughs> have yeah that no problem. kidding. <laughs> or it may be that they're just worried that, you know, they don't want people to think that this is like the novelization of their D and D game yeah. or, you know, that it's fan fiction or anything like that. But again, is is please get over it. You know, all of like 90% of your readership are, are active gamers in one way or another, and they're cool with it. Yeah. <laughs> like we're, exactly. all, we're all cool with it and we're ready to take your book and, and anybody's game and cetera at face value. And, yeah. you know, yeah dig and, for what it is yeah and i think you're absolutely right i mean there is something you know because when i was in junior high and high school which would have been the late 80s early 90s geek was a bad word right <laughs> you didn't yeah. want to be called a geek <laughs> right. and now you know people call themselves geeks and um mm -hmm. and uh you know just to talk to that you know like you said there was only a few people playing i remember i, I think it was eighth grade um I walked into a study hall, like the first or second day of study hall, and I walk in and I see this kid 
reading a Ravenloft book, right? Wow. Yeah, I know. Right? <laughs> and I, I just, I know we probably shouldn't have been talking or anything because it was a study hall. I just walked right over to him and I was like, do you play D&D? And he's like, yeah, do you? And like, he's still one of my friends, right? Because we, mm-hmm. <laughs> there just wasn't that many people playing. Uh, back yeah, then. it was. It was like, oh my God, it's like a sighting of a fellow gamer in the wild. <laughs> I remember when I first started dating who was who the woman who is now my wife. This would have was the very late 80s, 87. And she had a friend, a, you know, another girl. And we had met her and somebody else to go to the movies or something like that. And they pulled up in her car and there was a Dragonlance book, you know, paperback novel in, in her car. And I was like, uh, wait, do you read Dragonlance? And she's like, yeah, this is my wife's friend. Yeah. And I was like, you play D and D and she's like, what? No. I was like, well, you know, Dragonlance is like a D and D thing. She's like, no, it isn't. She was just reading it, had no idea that it had any connection yeah. to D and D to TSR to anything. Right. It was just, she just sort of read fantasy and heard that it was good. And, you know, that to me was really, that was eye opening and startling because I thought, no, you know, there's, it seems like it's bleeding out, you know, like it's, it's finding people in other ways outside of that kind of, you know, core culture, you know, that, that D and D, um, inner circle or something. And I remember that as I sort of went into the publishing side at TSR, I remembered that encounter, you know, it was only a few years, you know, Mm -hmm. before that. And I thought, Hey, this is where I think you can, you can find people, you know, that you can sort of bring them in Mm -hmm. with fiction and kind of bring them into this game, which, you know, still had a little bit of that, you know, it can be hard for people to sort of get into character and stuff like that. You know, some people are kind of shy to sit around like a a table with other people and play something that's so free form that isn't monopoly or something. Yeah. Um, But, you know, anyone can pick up a book and read, read a story. Yeah. I've also just wondered how much of it is that people who are kind of like my age now are the people who are creators of television shows and things oh, like sure. that, you know, that they, that they played in the eighties or whatever. And now it's just like, Hey, they're in charge mm-hmm. of a TV show or writing screenplays or something. And they're like, you know what I love? I love D and I'm just going to put that in my TV show. Yeah, no. And it has happened. I mean, you see that. And obviously there was community, that whole thing. Yep. And, yep. um, um, Mark Marin's TV show, Marin, he like the first episode, he had to go find this guy who was playing D and D at this, you know, kind of game store. And it's definitely now it's and the big bang theory, forget about it. Oh, right. Yeah. It was, you yeah. know, it's now just sort of a part of the culture and it's something that not just sort of this group of people do, but anyone could conceivably um be a part of. And everybody instantaneously knows, which I think is is you know the the sort of the first sign that something has has really penetrated the culture. You know when you know they're making fun of it on Saturday Night Live. Yeah, right? they're assuming that they have to assume that now everyone has heard of this, and it's not like what are they talking about? Yeah. Um, yeah. So you know by now, and then of course, who would have known the rise of podcasts? Right, <laughs> like what you're listening to right now. <laughs> Um, and YouTube and all those things where now we're starting, you know, people started to sort of live stream their games and record their games, talk about D and D in ways that, um, you know, just the technology of 1983 just would never have allowed. Um, it it just made it into what really feels now like this huge thing, which is to to me really amazing is that, you know, D and D seems to die every once in a while. And then, somehow manages to not just come back to life, but every time it dies, it comes back to life bigger. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, it's, you know, a cycle that just attaches itself to whatever is happening in, in you know, technology. You know, it's social media and um, YouTube podcasts and stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, you're just mentioning all those things like, uh, you know, critical role, of course, and, mm-hmm. and the actual play podcast. Uh, I always just find it interesting, too, because like when I was, you know, playing in the in the 80s, um, 
we didn't we didn't know how to play right because we were just mm-hmm. like reading the book and we just kind of were making up stuff and then when we'd come across another group who played i would just see how they ran things and say oh man i do right. that totally different and yeah. now you know you could just if i want to learn the rules to some game i just type in actual play for this game and i can see mm-hmm. somebody running it almost yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just something else. But now you went on, though, to write a number of the Dungeons and Dragons novels yourself and hit the uh, New York Times bestselling list, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that was with the uh, with Annihilation, which was my part of book five of the War of the Spider Queen or Ari Salvatore's War of the Spider Queen series. And, you know, that was sort of, you know, I, I don't think that there's a single editor in the world who isn't also an author right <laughs> it's kind of the best day job you can be you can get if you're a writer yeah. um i definitely learned more about writing um as i you know started to you know read other people's writing and really have to make decisions about it and and you know it, it's but then at the same time you're kind of and ne- and never thinking oh i could do this better but oh i want to do this too you know, this is fun. <laughs> this is really, this is really great. I want to, I want to join this or rejoin this in some way. Um, so yeah, I just sort of, you know, put my toe in the water with a short story when we were still in in Wisconsin um, that ended up in the in realms of the arcane, and then, you know, just started, you know, kind of nudging my way in there. The New York Times bestselling list is kind of a nudge, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, you know, that whole series was absolutely the hardest I think I've ever worked in my life. It was just, um, you know, six books, six authors with Bob Salvatore, you know, reading every single word of it and, you know, in the first draft stages and, and you know, he would come back with detailed notes. So it wasn't just yeah, whatever, I'll just sort of rubber stamp it and put my name on it and, you know, give me some money. <laughs> you know, he really, really took that very seriously. And, and it was just an enormous project to juggle. It was this um, huge, huge story. And, you know, every detail had to match up and, and pass from author to author in a way that, that felt seamless. Um, it was a tough one. So the fact that it, you know, found that audience definitely was made me extremely happy. <laughs> if that had just sort of got, you know, trickled into obscurity, that would have just been the worst defeat of all time. I don't know. You were just saying too about the cycles of Dungeons and Dragons. I think for a, a while, kind of the the role playing game hobby was kind of there in the kind of the late eighties, early nineties was kind of kept alive by uh, star Wars, the West end game system. Mm-hmm. But then the, the, uh, the Dungeons and Dragons novels kept Dungeons and Dragons kind of in the public eye, even at times when the, the role-playing game was having some uh, kind of tough times. Yeah. And, you know, I think what it, what it was is, you know, I mean, it's, it's so easy from, you know, a, sort of a far remove to, to start sort of criticizing some decisions that were made and at, you know, at TSR, particularly in the really in the early nineties with second edition in particular, which was sort of its first edition, but we're going to take out the stuff that we think is going to get us in trouble with one particular Baptist miniature minister, miniature (laughs) Freudian flip, I guess on that one Baptist minister from somewhere. So, you know, take the demons out, take the assassins out, take the half-orcs out. And how there was just something about it that just sort of felt like, yeah, you know, I don't know. They're not there with us. You know, they're not, they're not, uh, it's like TSR is kind of almost abandoning what made it great, which was this DIY nerd thing. And then, you know, there, there were other games that came out and people really latched onto them. I was never a big fan of Vampire, but at that time, that was the game that people were playing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so there were other companies that just kind of came out and, and took their piece of the marketplace. And then, of course, Magic yeah. just was the giant game changer. I mean, and, you know, I mean, in this case, literally, yeah. it changed me. <laughs> yeah. It changed people from, you know, to change people from uh, D&D gamers to trading card gamers. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. And, you know, I was a little late to adopt that, but, you know, we ended up, you know, you eventually, you kind of have to drink that Kool-Aid. The game actually really is that great. It was just a tremendous stroke of genius. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I remember when it came out and it was so popular, um, you know, me and my friends were like, oh no, like role-playing games are going to be dead now. Everybody's going right? to play card games. And yeah. then... Uh, of course, that just ended up fueling role-playing games, I think, down the line. <laughs> it did, yeah. I think what Magic did is it got, it got people into the idea of fantasy gaming, whatever yeah. that means, right, and, yeah. and tabletop gaming and sitting around playing. And I think it did. I think it ended up creating more D&D players than it, than it, than it uh, took away. Yeah. Not that. And, you know, the fact that the company that made it was run by a D&D fanatic, you know, yeah. Peter Atkins, that really, yeah. really helped because that's the thing when I started at TSR in September of 95, it was kind of, you know, little did he know yeah. that the company was hanging on by its fingernails. And it was less than two years later that we were in Seattle. I moved here in July of 97. And, you know, I don't know that I had a full year working there when it wasn't clear that something terrible was happening wow. and that, you know, th there was a good year that I thought, and everybody did like, is this the last day? <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, I mean, like one day we ran out of toilet paper in the men's room <laughs> and there was just no toilet paper. And so <laughs> one of my coworkers, Bill Larson, walked to the, there was a little supermarket like kind of down this hill right next to the uh, TSR offices and he bought some toilet paper and put it in there. Um, the Lions Club came and took the gumball machine out of the break room. It's like, what are the signs that things are bad? You know, the, the plant service, there was this lady that would come once a week and water all the plants and then one day she came with this huge cart and took all the plants away. <laughs> <laughs> like, and we're all just watching this sitting there watching this going like is any you know someone should probably is anyone going to tell us what's going on because i'm <laughs> am i paranoid because i'm seeing these as like warning signs you know? are you gonna <laughs> like have a this, desk in the morning <laughs> <laughs> this can't be good right when do they start taking the furniture out you know um and there was just no in, you know no information no one was saying anything oh, you know but yeah. it just got to be really because things weren't coming out. We knew that authors weren't getting paid oh, yeah. because they called, you know, like yeah. where's my money threatening with lawsuits and stuff like that. Um, and the only thing we were told was if anyone asked, say there was a problem with the printer, <laughs> like a problem with the printer, or it was the problem that the printer wanted to get paid. Cause that would be a problem. You know? <laughs> so I don't know. But, you know, yeah. I, honestly, the greatest, one of the great heroes of my life is Peter Atkinson. <laughs> I can't even begin to describe how much I owe that guy, that he just swooped in. I mean, literally, the Sarah Angel just appears as if by magic um, and just whisked us away to the Emerald City. <laughs> Yeah, and um, actually at uh, Gen Con Online, just as we're recording this, it wasn't that long ago, I listened to a few seminars on on about TSR and the sale mm -hmm. to Wizards, and uh, I, I found a lot of that fascinating because I, I didn't know a yeah. lot of the history there. And it is, it, you know, as you're saying some of those things, I think it would be hard for some people to believe, you know, looking at a, a product today that was like the number one selling book on Amazon for like months or something that was right. <laughs> that, that that could be that could belong to a company that was like running out of money and couldn't pay authors it's just it's just right. uh, I mean it's just almost hard to believe yeah and you know I think that there were you know and and like anything any sort of and part of real life like that and kind of you know the financial world that there was no one thing. It wasn't, well, this, you know, second edition was a failure or, you know, whatever it wasn't mm -hmm. really. Um, yeah. Or that this mistake was made or that this person, nobody, as far as I know, embezzled money or anything like that. Um, yeah. It was just, I don't know. It was just a combination of lots of things, you know, and, and I don't know exactly how it got that way, but um, really by the beginning of, 
really somewhere around the middle of 96, the company was basically insolvent. Mm -hmm. It just had no money at all. I think uh, Wizards bought TSR for its debt. Yeah. It just paid off the debt, and that's how much the company was worth. Um, yeah. But hey, all's well that ends well, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> so, no no and kidding. and what was great was that you know there were layoffs of, along the way, and some of those people were laid off and then brought back and then moved to Seattle. Yeah. Um, and it was not it was not a happy time. It was definitely really stressful and nervous. But yeah. um, for those of us who made the you know the trek west, uh, I, you know. I'll definitely speak for myself. It's really um, one of the best things that's ever happened to me. Yeah. Well, and uh, thank goodness for magic, right? It became a money printing machine that allowed. Right. That. Oh my God. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and which, which, which actually ended up have being kind of a double edged sword, right? It, it rescued yeah. us, but at the same time, the expectations yeah. um, from some of the people on the sort of finance side, um, <laughs> It's like there's a you know publishing doesn't really work on seventy five percent profit margins you know it's like <laughs> it doesn't really there's there's no such thing as that um, I we're always gonna be um, not so much the redheaded stepchild because Peter wouldn't allow that to happen because he was just a fan mm -hmm. um, but you know it was I, I was in more meetings justifying you know, my existence than anybody on the magic team has ever experienced. I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, now it, at the beginning of the show, I kind of tease one of your books a little bit and it's called writing monsters. Mm -hmm. And I know it's, it's kind of advice for a writer who is writing in fantasy, writing monsters, you know, and just thinking about, you know, obviously we've been talking about D and D and magic and those wouldn't really exist without monsters. And if you right. uh, look at, you know, popular movies, uh, how many of those have monsters in them? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, this might be a huge question, but what, what's, our, what's our love affair with being terrified by monsters all about? I think it go, it's literally as old as humanity, right? It really is. It's, you know, at some point in prehistory, we were lived in a world of monsters. We were surrounded by things that, you know, went bump in the night and then actually ate us, you know, <laughs> and it's a, you know, very long struggle to get us to the point where we are now, you know, the apex predator and every environment on earth and really just kind of walking around through life, getting really stressed about goofy artificial stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and never really thinking, boy, I hope I get to work without a leopard eating me, you know, <laughs> it's, just, it's just never, there was a bear, I live in the Pacific Northwest, really, you know, 20, 25 miles or so east of Seattle. We had a little black bear get into our backyard and wander around a little bit, right? And so I actually live someplace where there are kind of semi-dangerous animals. Cougars have wandered into the neighborhood every once in a while. But I don't live my life afraid of predators at all. <laughs> like, no animal is going to attack me, but at some, you know, through a good portion of, of um, I guess we can really say human prehistory, that was a real danger, you know, yeah. and so that carries through and we don't stop thinking that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. we, we don't necessarily, we don't literally fear it on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's ingrained in, and I think in every animal is this thing going to try to eat me? Um, and so we've tried to turn that, like we've turned a lot of things into this weird kind of artificial or art form that we're working through. And that's some of the things I talk about in that book where, you know, I think most monster stories really come down to that fear of the predator prey relationship being flipped on us. And so we're not safe from predation anymore that there's this, you know, that's what alien is really all about, that it's, there's this animal that doesn't get that we're not supposed to be hunted down and, and killed for food. Um, and we're stuck in that situation and our technology fails us. All of our, all of our weapons and our safeguards fail us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think monsters quarantine. 
they, they, they don't. Porn. <laughs> exactly. So there's a movie that we should all be watching. See what happens when you open the door when you're not. You know, you know, like, yeah. Leave the guy with the monster attached to his face on the doorstep. And, you, know, like, you had protocols we'll in place. That. You just broke exactly. Them. Yeah. <laughs> right. Pay attention to that rule. <laughs> so I think monsters have, you know, have definitely been with us all the time. The, the oldest literature we can find, right? Things like um, Beowulf and, and um, you know, the legends of Siegfried and, and yeah. the Odyssey are all full of monsters. Gilgamesh, yeah. 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 I mean, as far back as it goes, right? Cave paintings of, you know, scary looking animals and, you know, um, I think the one of the the earliest sculptures is a little wooden figurine of a. It looks like it has a human body and a lion's head. It's in a museum in Germany called the Lion Man. It's like twenty five thousand years old, and you know people were, you know, sort of grappling with this idea of. We know these animals, but what if there's an even scarier one? Yeah. So, you know, just basic some basic advice. What are you, what are you telling authors to do with monsters? Um. First of all, be original, right? Just saying it's a dragon and leaving it at that is not good enough. Make it your dragon, you know. Um, make it your vampire. Make it your zombie. I, zombies, I think, are so played out. But if you can make a zombie that's original and, and interesting, wow, that's going to be really <laughs> – that's going to be great. Um, and then also just really keep in mind that it's about – you know, it, it, it's about the imbalance of information that a monster is really sort of, more or less, it's an animal we don't know anything about. Like if you saw a shark and you didn't, had never heard of a shark, never seen a picture of a shark, never watched Shark Week, that's a monster. I mean, by anyone's definition, it's just the scariest thing. It's all teeth and it's just like doesn't care, doesn't think about um, you as a person, there's no negotiating with it. It's just, you know, we'll bite anything just to see what it tastes like and we'll just kill you for no reason um, or seemingly no reason or just to eat. Yeah. Um, but we know about sharks. So we know we can identify what that is. Where are they? How do you get away? You know, just don't swim off the coast of South Africa. If we've learned anything. Like, you know, don't do that. <laughs> but, yeah. but, you know, it, you know, I think most monster stories are, you know, like the mist, right? Is what even are these things? Mm -hmm. Where did they come from? What are they? We don't know what they're going to do. We don't know how to stop them. We don't know how to kill them. We don't know how many there are. We don't know, right? All of that stuff that makes us not at all afraid of, of uh, the animals around us, really, um, is all just taken away and we're just at the mercy of this unknowable thing. Mm -hmm. So that's the main thing, right? Keep them mysterious. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, right. Yeah. No, I, I think that uh, I think those two points are are good. That you you want to have some originality in there. You want to turn something mm -hmm. on its head, and you want to keep them mysterious. I, I think yeah. those are, are are really good points. Um, what would be? I guess maybe what would be say the difference between, you know, writing a monster in a movie and then, or a, a book or a novel, and then, uh, you know, introducing monsters into your D and D campaign. I think there's, there's actually a lot of similarities. I think more, than, more so than differences, obviously. And in writing monsters, I actually use D and D monsters as an example and, um, you know, talk about D and D monsters in terms of the rules sort of, or how a monster actually works. Mm -hmm. Because for me in, in any part of world building, whether it's monsters or sort of how magic works and all that stuff that goes into fantasy or science fiction, consistency is king, right? It, any crazy impossible thing will seem plausible as long as it works in a predictable way inside the fiction of your world. Mm -hmm. So you know, one of the things I said was, hey, take a look at role-playing games, D&D &D in particular, you know, for monsters. Mm -hmm. Because the game mechanics require, it has this many hit dice, right? It has, it can move this fast, it can fly or it can't. Um, it starts to, you know, categorize this thing or quantify this thing. Mm 
mm-hmm. which makes it consistent throughout. So, you know, the demands of, of the game mechanics really solve what a big problem that authors tend to have in fiction, which is, ooh, it, it would be cool if it could do this. Well, but it didn't do that in <laughs> chapter three, and now it's doing it in chapter eight. What's different? And, you know, yeah. now you're just kind of making stuff up as you go along. Whereas if you take a monster out of the monster manual, it is kind of telling you how strong this is, how fast it is, um, you know, what kind of special attacks it has. Yeah. And, you know, I think that that can actually be incredibly useful for authors and actually writing, you know, Forgotten Realms novels and stuff that use D&D as the basic world building. Mm-hmm. Um, I found that to be really freeing, actually, more so <laughs> than than stifling of creativity. It gave me a sense of, okay, now I know exactly what these can, guys can do. I know exactly what the monster can do or, you know, any particular characters. Like, you know, I had to do this giant spell duel between these two very high-level wizards in Annihilation, and Rich Baker had done had written up third edition D&D stats for both of them. And so I knew exactly what these guys were capable of doing. Um, and so sat down and actually just choreographed that whole thing um, just on a pad of graph paper because it has to be graph paper, you know, <laughs> but, but, you know, kind of parsed it out for this is the casting time. This is how long it would last. And, and, you know, just, and, um was very proud of myself, but I think I, you know, I felt really good about the end result is that, you know, you can actually see those spells taking place um, within the boundaries of third edition D&D. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that, I, I think that role-playing games can actually really help authors to kind of solidify what it is this thing can and can't do and to help keep you consistent throughout. Yeah. So uh, no vaguely defined superpowers that appear when the plot needs a little help. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing that will get you into trouble more than anything else, right? It's like, <laughs> why all of a sudden is this thing flying? You know, why all of a sudden is it, you know, um, it can spit acid all of a sudden? Why didn't it do that before? You know, um, <laughs> right? Yeah. And you know, it just, it has to feel, it has to, there's no such thing as realism in fantasy or science fiction. (laughs) Um, As soon as the spaceship goes faster than the speed of light, it's inherently unrealistic, but it needs to be plausible. It needs to have its own, whatever you can make up whatever rules you want, especially in fantasy. It's just magical. It just happens. Um, Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't happen consistently throughout, it's going to feel unrealistic it's because you're just breaking your own rules, not necessarily the, you know, the rules according to Newton or Einstein. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, just thinking about, you know, monster stories a little bit more broadly, just, um, uh, there seems to be two kinds and I think they're illustrated. You already mentioned one movie, which would be alien, but then it's mm-hmm. sequel aliens, right? So in, right. in alien, there's this one and there's this pause, mm-hmm. shock, slow kind of reveal of the creature over time. And then in mm-hmm. Aliens, you just get wave after wave of them. And that does seem right. to be kind of common in, in certain, you know, in, yeah. when, while telling monster stories. No, and I thought that was particularly brilliant, right? That too many sequels, especially when they're given to a different filmmaker as Aliens yeah. was. Yeah is sort of, well, I guess, okay, so there's a different spaceship and they land yeah. on the same, right? <laughs> and, yeah. and they try to repeat the same thing. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was, even just when I saw that in the theater for the first time, Aliens, I was just like, this is brilliant. This is exactly what you should do. Yeah. Um, it was the, a response to the first movie and it dialed it up. And I yeah. thought Alien is still one of the scariest movies ever made. Mm-hmm. And Aliens is one of the best action movies ever made. Yeah. And that's what I think was the genius behind that was I'm not going to try to make a horror movie. Yeah. Um, I'm going to try to make a, an action movie yeah. and, you know, James Cameron, you know, nailed that. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> nailed it. Um, you know, because that was the first movie said, okay, this is what this thing can do. Yeah. It bleeds acid. It's just nasty. It'll, you know, it it will find any little nook and cranny to hide in, and it will, you know, use the air ducts and all that kind of stuff. 
Yeah. Um, and one of them in a ship full of unarmed people yeah. where if you kill it and it, you know, it, it bleeds through your ship and everybody dies, you know, but now that the Marines are there, what they weren't ready for was, you know, however many hundred and fifty of them or whatever it was. Yeah, and a um, queen and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, and so it just turned it 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 made those kind of drone aliens, um, you know, enemies to be fought, yeah. and then that the the queen was really the new monster. It was it was bigger and smarter, yeah. which made it scarier. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I, every once in a while, I'll read some online about people criticizing James Cameron, and I always want to tell them there's a reason he gets to make any movie he, he wants to make because because he nailed it. <laughs> he nailed it yeah. right out of the box on like five, six, seven movies. He just nailed it. Yeah, like really, like really early on, he just was like, as soon as he got the big budget, you know, it was. Yeah. I he just did such a fantastic job with oh. that. Yeah, but I think that's really kind of interesting in terms of a monster story. Is some of them are like Alien, where you only really see the thing in full form right at the very end. Yeah, and it really is about you know clothes putting every, putting people in isolation, which is extremely common. Whether we're it's yeah. just this you know starship yeah. with a very small crew, or it's you know the Arctic research station and the thing underwater lab right exactly just sort of put these people you know in an isolated space where they can't just call 911 yeah. um can't just call in the army or something yeah and then this monster just you know whittles away at them we're trapped in a supermarket like in the mist and stuff yeah um and you know then there are some monster stories, which I also love, like Jaws, right? Which is really yeah. a mon- It's about a shark, but it's really a monster movie. Yeah. And for the first half of that movie, very happily, um, the mechanical <laughs> shark didn't work, you know, <laughs> and Spielberg ended up accidentally making a way better movie because of it. Mm-hmm. You only see the effect of the monster, which is a, something I talk about in writing monsters too, in terms of staging the reveal of it. So you're, sta- you're just sort of showing a little bit of it. Mm-hmm. And you're not really showing the monster in full view, but you're showing the effect of the monster. What is the monster actually doing? Yeah. So you're just seeing the, you know, the girl swimming around and then she gets pulled underwater and then, you know, thrashed around. Um, the dock gets pulled off and the guy has to swim back. And then the dock turns around and comes back. At him and stuff. You never see the monster itself. You're just seeing this, you know, powerful thing under there. That's, you know, it's completely hidden. Mm -hmm. and then right the movie just has this moment where it turns into okay we know what it is and we're going to go get it yeah and they get on the boat and everything about the movie changes it stops it's not nighttime anymore now it's daytime um the music changes from that ominous pulsing john williams thing Mm -hmm. to you know almost like sea shanties and you know a lot of it becomes brighter and and it turns, it goes from a monster movie to an adventure story. Once these guys say, yeah. okay, we know what this thing is and we're going to go get it. Mm-hmm. And we know, and we've got a guy who knows what to do and we're going to go kill this thing. And mm-hmm. to me, that was really brilliant. And I think that was what alien and aliens did in an expanded form. <laughs> you know, it was yeah. Yeah. one movie of the scary thing that you only kind of see in pieces and then a whole movie of, okay, now let's go. Yeah solve this problem yeah no I, I absolutely agree and i hadn't really thought of it just like how you just said it right there but i i mean i i think that is the brilliance of aliens right he just didn't rehash the first movie which would be kind of normal kind of course would be just to rehash <laughs> the 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 first movie and then jaws i know um I, I do like that as well, like the idea of hiding the creature and not seeing it. And I think mm-hmm. it made Jaws very powerful. But of course, there's a, a strain now in movie making where, um, you know, some years ago, you know, I went to college to be a screenwriter and things. And um, I, 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 people tell me I, I, I should say I pivoted. I, I totally gave it up but um, mm-hmm. because I needed food. But um, oh, I did, too, by the way. I oh. went to film school myself. Oh. 
Awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. And, um, but just reading about, say, like the sci-fi monster movies, they tell, they say, do the opposite, right? They say, show the monster, you know, show the monster in the first two minutes of the movie, have a death every eight mm-hmm. minutes. You know, they have a, you know, a pretty good formula and they want, because right. they want people to see the monster, um, you know, just kind of over and over again. Um, and I just think that's an interesting change in the way, you know, either story, something with storytelling or, the, you know, or, mm-hmm. or something. Yeah. No, I don't, I'll tell you what though. And this is just, I mean, I guess everyone can take this with a grain of salt coming from a guy who makes a living teaching people how to write uh, novels and short stories. Mm -hmm. But every, I would, I I would go so far as to say every book about how to write a screenplay really is a great, is is basically a step-by-step guide to why most movies are so terrible. (laughs) And that if you take, Though, if you if you sort of listen to the advice that you're given there, and then compare it to your least favorite movie, you'll see that in action. Um, and then when you comp- compare it to your favorite movie, it breaks every single rule they told you never to break. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know that. I think it's just. It, I have a feeling it's the money, right? It's tales of. Yeah. I wrote this spec script, and they bought it for a million dollars. That yeah. attracts a lot of people to that who just want to know how do I just get that million dollars. Um, and so, you know, they're, they want to hear, like you said, it has, this has to happen every eight pages. You're inciting incident, which is just a term that I hate so much. (laughs) You know, it has to happen on this exact page. And then two different books will give, you know, three different books will give you three different page numbers. Um, yeah, I think that's all just really, yeah. (laughs) I think I read all those. (laughs) Like, yeah like just really just don't and it's funny because yeah. most of the time i've i've seen interviews with great screenwriters they never reference any of those books and i would no. think that if you know if you sort of put a list of you know i don't know, go with the oscar winners for best screenplay in the last you know 10 or 20 years yeah. i would bet none of those people have read any of those books yeah, <laughs> yeah. um you know yeah. they're they're doing you know they're writing the best story they can come up with. And then yeah. of course it becomes this giant collaborative effort. So who knows yeah. Um, yeah. how the, the first screenplay actually matches up to the finished movie sometimes exactly. almost barely at all. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. I, I remember doing stuff like that and I'd mm-hmm. read those books and then I'd watch a movie and it it just wouldn't match up, right? Like yeah. it just wouldn't match up, and you're just like, <laughs> "Why is this totally different? This movie's awesome. Like, right. Why is it totally different?" And uh, and it could be, you know, because the complexity of it. And again, I had just said I love what I do because it's so it's such a tight circle. As an editor, I'm working with one author on this book, you mm-hmm. know, um, and as a writer, I'm working with one editor on one thing, and and that's it. You know, it doesn't go through, there's no production designer who says, well, you can't do that. You got to do this instead. There's no director of photography saying there's, it's impossible to shoot that. Why would we even, you know, there's no producer saying, you know, yeah, we could totally do that shot, except that would double the budget of the entire movie. Yeah. Um, So, you know, that, that part of the process makes me more forgiving of movies, right? Because how many things were just had to be compromised. And in some cases, right, like the mechanical shark not working, it ended up being a good thing. Yeah. So some maybe some of your favorite movies yeah. were, you know, because the, you know, yeah. three big scenes that they had hoped for just didn't come off. Didn't work, yeah. Um, for whatever reason. And, it, yeah. and they cut around it and turned it into something really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who knows? Absolutely. And really bad movies were just like, oh God, it was just a nightmare that everything went wrong. And, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I, I know. I f- I find it. I mean, it's a little silly, but I find it hard sometimes to uh, even criticize certain movies because. Um, 
you know, I, I did some guerrilla filmmaking and it was like, I broke myself like emotionally, physically, you know, <laughs> oh, spiritually, like trying uh-huh. to make this movie. And it was just like, it was unwatchable. And I'm just like, you know, I see a bad movie and I'm like, yeah, I'm with you, bro. It's exactly. Right. <laughs> no, I know. It, this is what happens. Right. You know, yeah. and, and so, you know, that was, a, I, I think I, I am kind of, you know, a guy who doesn't, you know, isn't really the center of attention and I don't have, I never had like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of friends and big parties and stuff like that. So, you know, I was always, I think drawn to, let me just kind of make this thing myself and then work with like a couple of people who really want to help me and are on my side and we're going to try to get this thing done. Um, and I don't, I hate the idea of gambling with anyone else's money. Yeah. So I just don't, you know, I couldn't imagine, Yeah. you know, somebody gives me $200 million and I'm supposed to make the Avengers. I like, yeah. I wouldn't, I would just freeze completely <laughs> thinking, you know, yeah, no I, just don't just like, like give that to, you know, all the, here, John Favreau wants to do it. <laughs> yeah, know, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, Russo brothers, he, go, go right ahead. He's willing to take that on. J.J. Abrams is standing over there. Like, yeah. just let them do it. I'm going to go over here and write some stories. Yeah. And I'm content to live in a smaller house, you know? <laughs> like, it's just, it, that's too much for me. But that was, you know, as a, you know, young, young kind of teenager, I thought, I, it was really Star Wars, let's be completely oh, yeah. honest, right? Oh, yeah. Where oh, yeah. I was 13 years old and it was just, it was made for me. That I was the guy that he made that for. It was literally <laughs> just, you know, he sat in a room and said, so there's this yeah. kid, Phil, in suburban <laughs> Chicago. So what would he want to see right now? And, you know, like, yeah. and, you know, I just absorbed every detail of that the making of it and all that kind of stuff and so from then on i was like that's what i'm going to do i'm going to you know make these movies oh, yeah. um and you know by the time i finished my education and just exactly how hard it is or certainly how hard it was and i graduated from college in 85 mm-hmm. um video was still just terrible <laughs> um you certainly didn't have you know, anything like iMovie. And I just thought, God, if I, you know, I've had any of the tools that people have now, forget about it. You know, I would have had, you know, three Netflix series by the time I graduated. <laughs> you know, like, like, I don't even understand. It was just so expensive. It was shooting 16 millimeter film. It was just so hard and took forever and yeah. so complicated. Oh, but yeah. um, anyway, in the end, really, I always just wanted to write. Yeah. So, you know, that's yeah. what I did. No. And that's what I do. Yeah, and that's great. And uh, um, I know I've had you on here a while, but I yeah. I just keep wanting to follow up with a few other things. No, and this is the thing. This will be this will become Dan Carlin's hardcore history if you don't stop me. Because I'll just you know I'm just sitting here at home. I'm I'm quarantined anyway. You know, like we're, we're not, yeah, no kidding. We're not going anywhere. All right. Well, if I could just follow up on a couple of things. One thing you just mentioned there. Well, of course, you're absolutely right. I was the first film class I had. We were shooting on uh, Super 8 uh, mm-hmm. film and it was it was um, it was very tactile and you got to know your film really well. But man, yeah. was it hard. <laughs> right. Like, oh, yeah. Oh my goodness. It was so difficult just to. Um, or you shoot and you have a light leak or something and then your, your footage is gone and it's just like, oh, I'm dropping. Any little thing just yeah. blows the whole thing up. Oh, and, and then you're like, do I even try, how do I even reshoot this? You run yeah. out of money instantaneously because everything yeah. was expensive. It oh, had yeah. to go to a lab. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh, the horror yeah. stories of yeah, just no it, nothing worked. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know. It was yeah, trying to do everything like in one take to make like a uh-huh. bowl of $50 film last, you know, for a whole movie or whatever. Right. I mean, that stuff movie. was just precious. Like yeah. I am not going to touch this yeah. until I know everything is perfect. Yeah. yeah. And but I've then, always been very math challenged. So, you know, uh-huh. I always ended up with my lights were too bright. They weren't bright enough. Oh, gosh. You know, everything was kind of not quite there. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, that does though that does go into something that I wanted to follow follow up on too. That you were, you know, we were mentioning Jaws and how the mechanical shark didn't work, and it made a better movie, which I think it totally did. Um, I mean, well, Spielberg says that himself that it, it yeah. that it, it that it set the tone of the movie and made it better. Um, just thinking about restrictions there, even though even they're talking about film. Um, just thinking about um, how kind of nowadays filmmakers, especially the the big ones, uh, you know, for right. Disney and some of the bigger studios and that, um, you know, there's almost a blank canvas, right? Like you can just, you can erase anything out of the background that you want. You can put in, you know, the sky you want, the trees you want, mm-hmm. whatever, you know, the buildings you want, whatever. Um, but just thinking back to, you know, some of the movies, say from the 30s, like some of the gangster movies from the 30s that couldn't show you know, for, you know, most of them for technical reasons, they couldn't show somebody being shot, even though the movie code hadn't come in yet. Sometimes right. they couldn't technically show somebody being shot with a bullet. So they did um, things where, you know, the, the shootout happens in a building and you just see lights up in the window. I'm forgetting that movie's name, but it's mm-hmm. amazing. Um, yeah. And uh, the, but now you can show everything. And I was just wondering maybe your take on that, just like that restrictions or limitations sometimes push an art form. Is that, is that right. what you think? Yeah, I think it. I, I think so. Yeah, I think sometimes, you know, it's it's. You always have to. I don't care what art form you're practicing, right? Whether you're a sculptor or a painter or a, you know, novelist or filmmaker, mm-hmm. um, you're always limited in some way, and. You know, I think, like you said, that not not every movie has the two hundred and fifty million dollar budget. You know, <laughs> not, yeah, yeah. not and and so if you're if you're working in science fiction, sometimes you have to decide what can I give up in order to tell the story that I'm trying to tell, mm-hmm. and how do I how do I work around not having this mammoth budget? And I think some of the best science fiction that I've seen in the last several years has actually been less um, effects driven, you know, movies like moon or code 46, you know, that don't really, Mm. that were actually fairly low budget movies. I thought were just really much more interesting because they had to, you know, right. Actually tell a story. It wasn't enough to just say, you know, you're, you're not going to really care about the relationships of people. Um, while King Kong is fighting two Tyrannosaurus Rexes, you know, it's like, (laughs) just, this is going to blow your mind and you're going to come out of that movie. Like, Oh my God, what just happened to me? Um, but if you don't have that kind of money, you're gonna, you know, what is left to you? And that's Mm -hmm. right. Like in moon, get one incredibly good actor and just, you know, put him through the mill. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, and, and, and obviously, if you're writing prose fiction like I do, mm-hmm. there's only so far you can go with what you have on the page. You know, you can't, you know, I, I suppose I was going to say you can't have illustrations, but of course you can. You know, <laughs> like, why couldn't you? You know, you could write a graphic novel, which is completely, you know, sort of its own thing. Um, but even then, that's limited. That's static. It doesn't move. You can't hear it, you know. So how do you you have to learn sort of how to conjure those images in people's heads. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, But either way, it's none of it is easy, you know? Yeah. Um, And that's where I think those screenwriting books tend to go wrong, which is here's exactly how you do it. And, you know, the books that I write about writing tend to always be, Oh, this is going to be hard. You know, Mm -hmm. this will help. Here's some things to think about. Um, But ultimately you're going to have to feel your way through this and make it your thing. No, I, I, I completely agree. And then just one really other just quick thing to follow up on. Um, we kind of mentioned, you know, some different monsters in movies and books and then using monsters from the, the monster manual. Um, mm-hmm. You know, say take Jaws, you know, a shark, um, or you were mentioning the bear in your backyard or a cougar. Um, mm-hmm. Those are those types of monsters, you know, because we're afraid of what they're going to do to us. What about the ones that we're just afraid of because of what they are like a ghost mm-hmm. or a, you know, Cthulhu or something like that. Right. Uh, so I'm like this completely big giant unashamed HP Lovecraft fan, you know, <laughs> I don't support 
this guy, you know, who made some bad cultural decisions a hundred years ago. Um, I don't really care who he was. I don't really you know. It, he left behind this body of work that was just so completely bizarre and original. Um, and he really tapped into something that was happening, you know, at, at the time that he was alive and writing, which was we're starting to understand more about the universe around us. Um, and monsters do tend to change depending on, you know, where we are historically and, and sort of the, the cultural setting that they come out of. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, like medieval bestiaries, which are some of the most amazing things to just flip through. You know? yeah, yeah. And you can Google that and see some of these crazy monster drawings and kind of weird cartoony looking griffins and, mm -hmm. and things that are kind of like lions, but with, you know, human faces and stuff. Yeah. That was incredibly isolated people who just didn't travel. You know, if you were a French peasant in the year, you know, 1100 something you didn't go on vacation to australia so you know it was like a few people would travel and they would kind of come back with these stories that then well you know we can't just say well it was like 15 different kinds of cats you know we we've got to make it sound more interesting than that so they came back with all these weird exotic creatures um or stories of these weird exotic creatures and that's what i think lovecraft was basically tapping into as well you know we now it's, you know, 1919, it's 1920, and we're understanding where Earth sits in the universe in ways that we didn't used to before. Mm -hmm. um, we don't see it as the center of the universe and so on. Mm -hmm. And he being, you know, obviously a classic xenophobe yeah. and probably just like, you know, crippling paranoiac mm -hmm. <laughs> that he actually yeah. was saw that as horrible like yeah. so there's just we don't know what could be out there and it can't possibly be good yeah. um so he just saw this universe full of unknowable monsters yeah. um he might be partially right at least you know who knows <laughs> what's creeping around out there you know but certainly the the universe itself doesn't care about yeah. us um and could just put a stop to the whole earth thing anytime it, <laughs> anytime it wanted to yeah. um so yeah. you know i think he's you know that he created a whole new i think created right or just sort of he had a whole new take on it that um i think is is particularly modern that's definitely where alien comes from oh yeah um it's oh. definitely where the thing comes from yeah um cosmic horror or yeah. you know something that like we've got Earth categorized. We know the different kinds of sharks and we know the different kinds of big cats and things like that. Um, yeah. But out there, there could be anything. Yeah. I think the, that anything. like outer space has become kind of the modern woods, right? Like, right. It you is. know, the, yeah. the, the ancient people would have said, what's in the woods? We have no idea. And we say, well, what's in space? We have no idea. Exactly. It's the, it's the part of the map that says here be dragons, yep. right? Yeah. That, it's some somewhere it, it's out there we don't know mm -hmm. so let's just assume it's terribly dangerous yeah 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 although i think i think a few of those uh the few of those authors of the medieval bestiaries i think they were trying to pull somebody's leg i think they were full oh yeah <laughs> yeah and that's the thing that also you know is interesting about once you start really studying monsters and start looking back at like you had asked me about where did that start? Where did that come from? All the way back. Because we yeah. always have to remember, and I think some people don't, right? Yeah. Which is where you get all the goofy ancient astronaut stuff. <laughs> you know, Giorgio, what's his name? With the, it was aliens. <laughs> you know, like, it's all aliens, Phil. It's all aliens. <laughs> because there seems to be this weird inability for people yeah. now to yeah. understand that somebody in ancient Egypt also had an imagination. Yeah that you know yeah. homer and all you know all of these <laughs> authors from you know 2000 3000 5000 years ago also had imaginations cuz they weren't monkeys they weren't you know they were yeah. humans yeah. and they're humans you know with brains that are basically exactly like ours yeah. and why couldn't they invent a monster 
yeah. you know, when, when are we deciding that, well, we didn't have imaginations until <laughs> what year, you know, what was it? 18, uh, Jules Verne 70. or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, first, right, the inventor of the imagination, Mary Shelley, like, yes, I, you yeah. know, I, right. So yeah. yeah, they, they went, they wanted to sell books. They're like, you know, yeah. and, and a lot of those were written by people who never left Europe. Yeah. But they said, yeah. well, you know, I've read all of the accounts of journeys to the Orient and here are all the things, you know, yeah. guy with, you know, people w- who only have one leg and people yeah. with their faces on their stomach and yeah. like, what? <laughs> this, was, this was not real. These were pretend things. Yeah. Um, and it's been pretend the whole time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Phil, I could talk to you, I think, probably the rest of the day. (laughs) (laughs) But um, I I should just ask real quick, uh, you know, thank you so much for your time, being gracious with your time. Well, thanks Uh, for having me. Yeah, no problem. Where can people find you online and learn more about your writing and stuff like that? Well, you have to follow me on Twitter. (laughs) Um, That's at Phil Athens. It's just P-H-I-L-A-T-H-A-N-S. and then my blog is Fantasy Authors Handbook. That's Fantasy Handbook at WordPress.com. And really, from either of those places, you will find links to anything and everything that I might be up to. Okay. And uh, I'll make sure that uh, I put links uh, to your Twitter and to your blog in the show notes for this episode at DiceGeeks.com. So anybody who's listening can head over Fantastic. to DiceGeeks.com, see the show notes there, and uh, be able to check out your books. So, uh, Phil, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you. All right, there you go, guys. Oh, man, that was so cool. (laughs) Just getting to talk to Phil about writing, about monsters, a little bit of Lovecraft in there. We also got some history on TSR, the Wizards buyout, all kinds of cool stuff. So, man, I just really hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. If you want to check out Phil's book, Writing Monsters, and trust me, you want to check it out, head over to DiceGeeks.com. In the show notes for this episode, I have put links to his book. I have also put links to his other books, his Forgotten Realm novels, all kinds of things, uh, his blog, his social media, so you can check out his work and learn more about what Phil is up to these days and his impact on Dungeons & Dragons as well as tabletop RPGs in general. Now, if you want some free stuff, head over to DiceGeeks.com slash free. You'll get 10 free dungeon maps. You'll never miss an episode of this show. And each and every Friday, you'll get an email from me letting you know what is happening in this madhouse that is called Dice Geeks. If you enjoy this show, please consider supporting it in some way. You can just tell a friend about the show. You can share the, the show on Facebook or Twitter. You can rate the show or leave a review wherever you're listening to this podcast. Those things just help the show out immensely, and they just help more and more people find the show. Also, if you are in a position to support the show financially, uh, that would mean the world to me. You can head over to patreon.com slash dice geeks, and you can learn how to support the show financially there. Every bit of support that I get on Patreon just ensures that I will be able to keep producing episodes of this show. Now, I thank you so much for listening, and until next time, keep gaming.